Got a minute? Oh, we're on. Oh, we're on. All right, well, welcome to Maranatha Baptist Church and to our Sunday school, uh, of course, in the auditorium, the uh, adult Sunday school class here, of course. But it's good to see those who are here present with us and those who are watching uh, live with us. That'd be good. Uh, anybody have any prayer requests and we'll get started from there? Yes, sister, and make sure I can hear. <laughs> I'll do my best. Okay, Roger Newton's going to have gallbladder surgery Friday. Oh, that's, that's pretty easy. That's easy stuff. Yes, Sister um, Stanfield. I'll try to listen to All right. And this is your Sister Anne. Anne. Anne, okay. Pray for her Sister Anne and for others. Yes, Terry. <laughs> and, um, so I have good days and I have days where I yeah. barely walk. She also has to get injections all the time for her back. So we're, we're just, we don't have a good body. <laughs> Between the two of y'all. <laughs> Between the two of y'all. And then to have, be responsible for three very young children that are very, very active. And they have stairs in their house. So, you know, um, just pray that for our safety there. Right. Okay. Pray for Terry and her in Jamaica as they travel this coming Saturday. It'll be gone for nine days or so. <laughs> yeah. Pray for them. Sister Irby. Pray for her niece Darla for the chemo this week and for Brother Taylor having surgery. Uh, yes, Russ. Okay. Pray for Pam's brother. Your brother? brother. Your brother. Appendicitis, but he's home now. Good. Anybody else? Yes, Terrence. We've been asking for prayer for Mike's niece, Kayla, with leukemia. We just found out that she's going to have her bone marrow transplant June 10th. So she just finished a lot of time at chemo just because I need the chemo down, obviously. But uh, her donors come from Germany. Whoa. And, and she's a niece? Yeah, it's my sister's daughter-in-law. Okay. Pray for her to, for this bone marrow transplant. Now, uh, this side over here. Anybody? They're super spiritual over here. They're all prayed up. They just, you know. <laughs> needy. Anybody? Anybody? Anybody else? It's definitely pray for each other. I mean, we can't say it enough, but pray for each other. And... Uh, Pray for, you know, souls getting saved and lives changed and the church growing and, and uh, pray for our pastor, the wisdom he needs as he leads us and puts up with us, I think, sometimes. But he's, pray for him every day uh, to encourage him as well in his family. Anybody else? Anything else? Anybody else? Okay, let's go Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for taking care of us. Uh, we can never say thank you enough, but... We just want to say thank you for your mercy, your grace, for your salvation. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for dying for us on the cross. We, we ask you to forgive us when we fail you, Lord, where we sin and, um, each and every day. And, and help us, Lord, to be vessels meant for your use. We ask for these prayer requests that, uh, that you heard this morning. And, and, and some people you know, don't, don't say the prayer request, but they're thinking of them. It's on their hearts. As well here, Lord, we ask you to help in these requests um, and, and touch these people that are going through surgeries, through chemo, um, bone marrow transplant. Uh, Lord, we just ask you to help each one of them, if you would please, in uh, the gallbladder surgery for Carolyn's 
a family member, that you'd help each one of them. Help uh, Terry and her daughter as they travel this, this coming week, the strength that they need and ability as they travel safely back and forth and, and help them and take care of them. We ask you to help those and um, those are not able to be here, Lord, their, their health that they're dealing with. And we ask you to encourage them and help us as a church how to encourage each other, uh, how to be a blessing and encouragement one to another. <clears throat> Dear Father, we ask you to help if pastor the strength and the grace and the wisdom he needs as he, he leads us, Lord, and preaches this morning and just hugging beside you, Lord, the strength and encouragement that he needs. Help us to work together to... Uh, to honor you, to give you the glory and everything. And we ask for this morning, uh, for this Sunday school lesson, that you'd be honored and glorified in all that's said and done here uh, in the Sunday school classes, Lord, in the children's ministries, uh, just guide and direct, and about the bus ministry to start up some, sometime soon. And Lord, help those who are lost to realize how lost they are. Each one of us got lost family members, and we think about them, we pray for them, and help us to be a witness to them, to make a difference to win them to you. We just guide and direct our steps this morning. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. A couple of things. We have our new series. We'll start Jonah in a couple of weeks. We're on lesson 11 in this series. So we've got two more lessons here. Lesson 12 and 13, of course. So we've got new lessons after that is Jonah. So i got those up here. Of course, same as before, the rubber band holds all your lessons together. That's, all, that's what you need is a package together. So that'll be the lessons uh, Jonah are up here. So if you want to pick those up after a Sunday school class, of course. So we're in lesson 11, and we're talking about consider Christ. Yeah, there. Consider his, e, if I say it right, eternality. We don't normally say that word. Uh, it's a little awkward in a way to say it. This lesson's going to be a little different for you. And I know you got your little books out, your little books, and you're ready to fill in the blanks. Well, you're going to fill in the blanks, but it's going to be towards the end of this lesson. Because I address this lesson a little differently. Because turn to John chapter 8, because that's where it's at anyways. So turn to John chapter 8. As I read through this lesson this week, and I kept going through it and through it, there's, I just say, you know, I want to do this lesson a little differently. Based on John chapter 8. Because even though this lesson's on cha chapter 8, but it's on the latter part of the book, the latter part of the chapter, it does kind of go back into the early part of the chapter. So I want you to give the background to chapter 8 and the setting, but we're going to go through chapter 8, the entirety of it, because I'm going to show you about the eternality of our Lord and how he dealt with people through this. And hopefully we'll learn something that will help us as well, but to learn about him, you know, how gracious the Lord Jesus Christ has always been and how he gracious he was even in dealing with those he had to deal with. Uh, through his. So what you're going to see this morning and you're going to see this the questions, the responses and eventually the climax. And I'm going to go through this chapter for you and you're going to see as I was reading through this chapter I kept noticing the questions that were posed to him. Now that's not in your lesson book. You won't look, look through your little tablet. You won't your sheets. You won't see any of this part here. But we'll touch on this and we'll get to the, and I'll let you fill in the blanks towards the end because that'll be towards the end of this, those slides involving those parts. <clears throat> so are y'all with me on this? How this is a little differently for you this morning. I don't want to be so fill in the blank regimen in a lesson. But as I was studying this lesson, I just thought there was something more to it than just that part of that. About seeing this chapter as a whole and how the Lord dealt with people and how he gets to the point where he explains to the very end, says, before Abraham, I am. And the responses of those guys who were there, the Pharisees and the scribes and all those that were there, of course. Because he dealt with them through this chapter here. So we're going to see it as we go through, and hopefully you'll, you'll see it as I saw it. Maybe it'll help if I can explain as we go through. But, but you're going to see, as we go through there, it'll be a, each uh, section, it'll be a, a reference. It'll be the questions that they propose to him, or the challenge, as I call it, the challenge to him, and then our Savior's response to them. So hopefully we'll learn something that would help us here. So if you turn to John chapter 8, and if hopefully you're there, it says, John chapter 8, verse 1 says, Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives, 
And early in the morning he came into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. So get the setting. He has now entered the temple. He's sitting down, and the people have come, and he's doing what? He's teaching them. And so in this challenge here, you're going to see a few things, and he's teaching them as we go through this. So the first one, John chapter 8, verses 3 through 11. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses and the law commanded us that, that, that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? The question is, what sayest thou? Okay. That, this they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down. And with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Now picture this, and we'll finish this up in a second. But picture what you see in here. Jesus is, he's going to the temple to do what? To teach. Okay? And here the Pharisees have done what? What have these guys done? They've gone out and tried to catch some woman doing something wrong, adultery, being adulterous, of course, in the very act. And so they bring her down here to him. Here, okay, Jesus, we found her, and the Moses law says she needs to be stoned. So what, what, what sayest thou? You're such a great teacher. You tell us what should be done. But Moses says this, but what are you going to say? And what are they trying to do? They're trying to, trying to trick him. They're trying to find something. What did it say there? And they, and, and they said, uh, where does it say um, They said, tempting him, that he might have, they might have to accuse him. Thank you. They were trying to find out there's a way to accuse him. That he violated the, 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 the law of Moses or something. Okay? And how does our Lord respond with them? Seemingly, he's ignoring them, yes. And he's writing on the ground, in this area here, with his finger on the ground. Now, we don't know what he wrote there. Probably could have been a... Passage of scripture. I don't, I don't, we don't know. There's no indication what it might be. So when they, can you imagine they're constantly asking, okay, so, 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 Rabbi, what do we do? I mean, Moses said this, so Rabbi, what do we do? They keep asking him this. Can you get that setting? And then he does what? It says, so when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto him, unto them, he that is without sin among you, let him cast a stone at her. What's he do? He does what? He's not tempting them, but he's putting it back onto them in a way. You know? For them to think about their selves. And you're going to see this as he goes through this chapter 8. How he puts it back towards them. As we go through this. And it says, and again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at this, the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he saith unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? Now, the Lord already knew that. I mean, he's just asking the question, proposing it, putting it out there. But he, and she said, she said, no man, Lord. And Jesus said, there, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. So this passage here, this, this is the question that they posed to him was what? What saith thou? And it's interesting they come to him knowing that he's in the temple doing what? He's teaching. So they're, they're trying to find a way to trick him. Trying every which way they can. Because they want to get rid of him. Okay? And how does he respond to them? Isn't he kind of gracious in how he responds to them? I mean, he's gracious, but he's direct to them. Which one of you have without sin? Let you cast the first stone. And they all start thinking, well, you know, I know I got sin. And they start kind of drifting away, you know, these guys. Okay? So the next situation... Verses 12 through 18. 
Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Now, interesting what he's saying here. We're so familiar with our Lord Jesus Christ. We're so familiar with what he said. We're so familiar with these passages. But to think about in that time when he says this to them, for the light to click on in their little brains, when he says what? That he is the light of the world. You see what I'm saying? We're, we're so accustomed. Okay, I've heard it. Yeah, Jesus light of the world. Okay, I know that. But for him to say that at that time, and then for them to, their little brains to start thinking about this, because he's, the Pharisees, it says, and the Pharisees therefore said unto him, Thou bearest record of thyself. Thy record is not true. And then that their challenge, uh, where it says, Thou bearest record of thyself. That's their challenge to him. You're saying that about yourself, Rabbi. You're saying about that. You're bearing this record about yourself. And what goes, it goes on down here. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Though I bear record of myself, yet my record is true. For I know whence I came and whither I go. But ye cannot tell whence I come and whither I go. You judge after the flesh. I judge no man. And yet I, if I judge, my judgment is true. For I am not alone, but I and the Father have sent me. It is, it is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one that bear witness of myself, and the Father that sent me beareth witness of me. Interesting. What did he say to them? Anybody? This is Sunday morning. Get, get the wheels a little rolling up a little here. Get the wheels rolling. What does he present to them? Yeah, but also... He's claiming to be God. Right. And who is he claiming with him? The Father. That should have been a light bulb going off there. Because he says, the witness is him and the Father together. When they had heard the Father, they, sh they should understand that. And they're going to ask this question, who is your Father, of course. They're going to go to that point. But he's trying to get the wheels rolling on their side as well. Because he says to them in verse uh, 18, I am one that beareth witness, bear witness of myself and the Father that sent me bear witness of me. Of course, and the Father that sent bear witness with me. That's his response to them. Of course, that leads to another situation with these guys again. So in verses 19 through, well, 20, just 19 and 20, I thought. These words spake Jesus in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no man laid hands on him, for his hour was not yet come. Now, don't you think at this point, these guys are getting a little bit riled up? They were already riled up when they came in there and brought that woman caught in adultery and put him to shame. But now they're getting riled up again. But they would not lay their hands on him. And like the scripture said, his hour has not yet come. Then said Jesus again unto them, I go my way and you shall seek me and shall die in your sins. Whither I go, you cannot come. Oh, I there should have been more verses than that. I went further. Then uh, verse 21. Oh, verse 19. I, I skipped verse 19. Then said they unto him, Where is thy father? Where is thy father? Now he presented to them his father and him, or father and him bear witness together. So the two bear witness together. So they're asking, Where is thy father? Jesus answered, Ye neither know me nor my father. If ye had known me, ye should have known my father also. So where is thy father? And then his response back is that you do not know his father. But who are these guys? The religious leaders, aren't they? But they don't know him. So the next, here's the next passage. I know I, verses 21 through 24. Then said Jesus unto them, I go my way and you shall seek me and shall die in your sins. Neither I, whither I go, you cannot come. Then said the Jews, will, the, will he kill himself because he saith, Whither I go, you cannot come? And he said unto him, Ye are from beneath, and I am from above. Ye are of this world, and I am not of this world. I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins, for if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. 
Will he kill himself? Because what did he say to them earlier? They're questioning because he says, right before that passage there, he said, I go my way and you shall seek me and shall die in your sins. Whither I go, you cannot come. But they cannot come. He's trying to get them to think a little bit here. And he's, he's telling them the truth. And they still don't grasp this. And so they're in their little minds. They're thinking, well, he's going to kill himself. If he kills himself. We can't go where he's going. I mean, those people who kill themselves, they go down to Hades. I mean, that, they're, automatically that's where they go at. That's their mindset about him. That's what they're thinking here. So the difference in their origins, because he says in verse, I said therefore unto you that I, you shall die in your sins, for if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. And I think it's interesting he points out to them about their sins now. Even though he addressed them that in, with the adulterous woman, if there's any sin, if, what did he say there? He is without sin among you. Let him first cast a stone at her. But now he's addressing about their sins. More, you know, another direct way of doing it, I guess you want to say it. So the next question comes up. Verse 25 through 29. Then said they unto him, Who art thou? I, I, I just tend to picture here these guys thinking, and I say guys, and I think most of them are the, the Pharisees and the scribes and those guys, those kind of leaders there keep poking at him, you know, with these challenges, the questions they keep pushing at him. You know, they're the ones the most apt to speak out against him. And so they're there, and, he's, and they're, they're like trying to get them to think, but also they're thinking about like, well, who are you? You know? And they said, who art thou? And Jesus saith unto them, even the same that I said unto you from the beginning, I have many things to say and to judge of you, but, but he that sent me is true, and I speak, uh, I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. Uh, let's go them. They, they understood not that he spake to them of the Father. Because he had already told them the Father and him are together. I mean, they, they're in agreement. They are, uh, Father and him get, bear witness. Remember we talked about that earlier. And now he's talking about the Father has sent him here. Okay? He's, the Father sent them. He said, even the same that I say unto you, from the beginning I have many things to say unto you, to judge you, but he that sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. In verse 27, they understood not that he spake to them of the Father. Then, then said Jesus unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then, then shall you know that I am he, and that I do, the, do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. And, he's, and he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. Yeah, verse 29. I do always those things which please him. So, who art thou? But as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. I, I'm just trying to picture how the setting was for them when they challenge him, who art thou? And then he dresses back to what? What's he pointing out to them again? What is he pointing out to them? About him and the Father. The Father has sent me. And they question, well, who is your Father? Right? And so he's talking about the Father, which he's talking about God. And they don't, they don't know who he is. And it goes on further on as we go through this. You'll see this comes out more. This is one of the interesting chapters where the word Father is used as many times as it is, as it is in um, chapter 14. I think it's chapter 14. It's the only other chapter in John where Father is used as many times as this is. In the relationship here. I got my notes over here. I don't know why I didn't turn them. I know that I told you this lesson will be a little different for you. The next one is, yep, there it is. Verses 30 through 38. And he spake these words, and many believed on him. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him. If you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Then answered him, they answered him, We be Abraham's sin, seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, you shall be made free? Now stop a second. 
Had they not been in bondage before? They had been in captivity a few times. Now this present generation is under whose rule? The Romans are ruling as well. And they say, How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? And Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committed sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. If the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. I know that ye are Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me, because my word hath no place in you. I speak that which I have seen of my father, and you do that which ye have seen of your father. Interesting here as well. They said, how sayest thou, ye shall be free? They're, they're quoting what he said and how he responds back to them. And how is he responding back to them? What is he presenting back to them? I know I ask a lot of questions. Y'all say, why is John McBride having to do this on a Sunday morning? It is kind of warm in here, isn't it? Yeah. It's warmer when you're up here when you got little beady eyes looking at you too. Um, so what is he presenting to them? Isn't there a difference here he's pointing out to them? A few things, okay? The difference in their fathers. Let's look at that again. Verse 30, go down to 34. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever committed sin is the servant of sin, and the servant that abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. Abideth ever. If the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. I know that you are of Abraham's seed. They are of Abraham's seed. But you seek to kill me because, you're, you, you're, because my word hath no place in you. I speak that which I have seen with my father, and you do that which is seen with your father. Now this gets to the next question here about their father. When he talks about the devil to them. But he's pointing out to them. Interesting, he points out to them about their sin. About how sin's going to separate them here. If the Father, verse, verse 36, if the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. And how is he addressing himself? He is the Son. He is the Son. And he's addressing to them, Jesus says, being the Son, if he sets you free, you will be free indeed. This is a little deep theology in a way to them. You think about it. It's a little deep theology to our little, little brains as well. But our Lord Jesus Christ, I think because we can stand back and we can look at the whole, we know that we got the whole New Testament, we look back at, oh yeah, I understand all that. But I'm trying to picture in my mind with those guys, and I say these leaders here, trying to take this in and trying to understand this. And he's pointing out about what? He's pointing out about their sin. He's pointing about that you're trying to kill me because your father is not the same as my father. You don't, you, 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 you're against me because your father, and he's going to address this in the next section, section here, you'll see this, is different. 39 through 47. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. I mean, that's where they're taking their stand. Abraham is our father. I suppose put like a special halo around them. You know, like we're Abraham's seed. We're, we're special people. And were they not? They were of Abraham. They're descendants of Abraham from the, the Jewish people. But they're taking that stand that we're of Abraham. And Jesus say, saith to them, If you were of Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man that had told you the truth which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. You do the deeds of your father. Go further on. You do the deeds of your father. Then said they unto him, We, we be not born of fornication. We have, no, no, we have one father, even God. And Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I, perceiveth, for I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear my word, you are of your father the devil, and the lust of your heart you will do. You will, he was a murderer from the beginning, and, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own. 
for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you, uh, I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Which of you convinces me of, of sin? And, I, and if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He that is of God heareth God's word. You cannot be, hear them not. Ye therefore hear them not because ye are not of God. They said they were what? What did they say about their selves? Okay. Right. And then they also, what else they say here? What else did they say? We're of Abraham's seed, but we're also what? Who's our father? Pardon? Not a fornication. And who else did they say was their father? God was their father. And Jesus is pointing out, if God was your father, you would not seek to try to kill me. You would accept him. You would accept the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus is pointing out to them that he is who? He is the son of God. He's pointing out to them. Instead of just, he didn't just say, I am the son of God. But if you hear what he's saying here, he says the son um, of God, where was it at? Because I tell you the truth, verse 45 I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Which of you convinces me of sin, and I say the truth? He that heareth, uh, verse 47, he that is of God, heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because you are not of God. That's not where I want to see. Let's go back to verse 42. If God were your father, ye should love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Talking about the Father sent him. And then he's already addressing them earlier about, who, about the Father. And now he's addressing again, the Father's the one who sent him. He is the Son of God. There's a lot going on in our little brains with all of this. And these are supposed to be religious leaders, you know, who have some insight about scriptures and all that. But they're still struggling with this. But he, what is he doing? He's laying it out to them. He's putting it out to them about this. And that if God was your father, you would love him. You would listen to him. You would hear the things he had to say. And he says what? You are above your father, the devil. That's pretty strong words, isn't it? To put it that way. Because they were trying to take a stand. Well, Abraham's our father. And they said, well, well God's our father. He says, no, you're a father of the devil who's a liar, a murderer. So the next one here, verses 40 through 52. Then answered the Jews and saith unto him, Say, not, say we not well that thou art a Samaritan and hast a devil? When they call him a Samaritan, what are they doing? A, that's right because Samaritans were what what were the Samaritan people they were half breeds weren't they part Jew and part Gentiles that's what they were so you're, you're a Samaritan so what are they getting to what are they doing I mean, what is the defense that some people get into name calling try to put, them, try to put him down you're, you're a Samaritan or, uh, that has a devil. They are really riled up now by this point because he's already told them that their father is the devil. And they're getting really riled up. And he goes on and says, And Jesus answered, I have not, I have not a devil, but I honor my father, and ye do dishonor me. And I seek not my own glory. There is none that seeketh and judges. There is one that seeketh and judges. Verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. What did he say? I have, I have not a devil, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. They're getting to this. They're really getting riled up, these guys. Getting upset. So the next one is. We got, I think we have two more here. Verses 80. Verse 53 verse, and 56. 
Art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead, and the prophets are dead? Whom makest thou thyself? Now, of course, they're going back to Abraham's our father. I mean, that's where they're going back to. They're going to go take that stand again. And Jesus answered, If I honor myself, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father that honoreth me, of whom ye say that you are that he is your God. Boy, doesn't that put that together for him? Did you see that? He says what? The same one, this, what do you say there? If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father that honoreth me. Of whom you say that he is your God. Remember they said that earlier. They said we have only one father and that's God. Okay. He's pointing out to them that he is of God. The Lord Jesus Christ is of God. The son of God. If ye had not known him. If, if, if yet ye have not known him. Yet ye have not known him. But I know him. And I, if I say. If, if I, and if I should say I know him not. I shall be a liar like unto you but I know him and keep his saying your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day and he saw it and was glad can you imagine hearing those words them guys hearing those words right there your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day and he was glad verse uh, what is it 53 art thou greater that was their challenge whom makest thou thyself and your father, and his response was, your father Abraham, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. I think it's interesting how he addresses them very graciously, but very directly, with gracious and kindness, but also direct to the point to get their attention about their sins. And they're doing what? They're getting riled up. And all the time he's pointing out to them, we're going to get to the last section here in a second. All the time he's pointing out to them what? About their sins, yes. But also about what? The climax we're going to get to in the next passage here. That him and the Father are one. Pointing that out to them. And that they are one. They, him and the Father are one. And you guys are not of this. So let's get to the last one here. Verses 57 through 59. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet 50 years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus saith unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. And what does that mean when he says, I am? That he was God. And what does the next passage say here? They all shouted, rejoiced in him, and great, this is fantastic, we now found him. That's not what they were doing, were it? The next passage says, then they took up stones to cast at him. Their anger had risen so much, they were trying to get rid of him. They wanted to get rid of him anyways. But all through this chapter 8, did you see it progress through? Hopefully you saw it progressing through this. The events, the questions they, they presented to him and how he responded to him. And he brings the climax to this. That he is God. They didn't catch on early when he said that him and the Father are one. He tried to present that to them. They weren't catching on to that. So finally he gives it to them that he is. He is before Abraham. Abraham saw his day. And they said, well, you're not even 50 years old. How can you, how do you know Abraham? And they said, and how, has thou seen Abraham? And, they, and Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I send you. Before Abraham was, I am. And when they heard that, that riled them up to the to extreme, to the climax of their hatred, but the climax of talking about the pre-existence of Christ, that he is God to them. So hopefully you learned something in this lesson, how I pointed it out a different way for you. Instead of how the I'll, I'll get you to the bullets here in a second, oh, so you can fill in your blanks, so you get your pens ready, so you can fill in the blanks here in a second. But do you see this? How it this whole chapter about the questions, the questions from these, the challenges from these people to him, and how he addressed them. He could have said from the very beginning, "I'm Jesus Christ, I'm the Son of God," and that's the way it is. But as he worked through this with them. 
answering and graciously, I think graciously in his way, answering their challenges, you know, as he did this with them. You know. Some of us, how would we challenge when we were if we're challenged, how do we handle the challenge of sometimes? We're challenged and somebody's questioning us, what do we do? This is the way it is, and I'm not talking about it no more. But he was trying to get them to understand their condition, that they were sinners. You know, they should have got the hint at the very beginning with the adulterous woman. You know, they kind of faded away back, but then they came back again and challenged him again. But he's trying to get their attention that, hey, you're sinners. And you don't, no matter how religious, how much you think you are, you're not of God. Any questions, any comments? All right, I'm going through the slides here. I'll try to go slowly so you can fill in your blanks. So I, like I said, you're going to see this and you're going to say, Johnny, you didn't follow the lesson plan. I know I didn't. Totally didn't. To honor the Heavenly Father. And the, past, the lesson took, like I said, it went back and forth. And I wanted to go from, I wanted you to see the background of chapter 8 and follow it through. To me, it, it made more sense to follow chapter 8 that way for me, okay? If I go too fast, hey, you say, whoa, 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 slow it down. Okay, the promise of the Savior. A conditional promise. An eternal promise. The pre-existence pre -existence of, of the Savior. Jesus is equal with the Father. And I want you to see that as we went through the lesson, you should have seen that as he's addressing that with them. Not just this passage, but he was addressing that with them as well. And Jesus is eternal with the, with the Father. Everybody get all their... That's the last part. Anybody need to go back? Anybody... Well, we'll go. There's the beginning. There you are. To glorify, I think the first one was honor, to glorify the promise of the Savior, the conditional promise, eternal promise, pre existence, equal, eternal. All right, everybody. Got it all. Like I said, um, you got any questions? Anybody got any questions? We're almost we're done here in a few minutes. I know you all are just anxious. Let's get out of here. <laughs> yes, Terry. It's almost it's very similar to what you encounter today with a lot of people. They they think they're going to acknowledge God. They'll say, "Oh, yes, I know God." They'll, and they'll, they might even acknowledge Him as their heavenly Father, but. And that is a very good point because you think about today how many people are religious in their lives oh yeah I know God I'm, I'm, you know, I'm no God I'm, we're, we're tight we're close you know I know him I talk to him every day but do you know his Savior do you know the Savior the Lord Jesus Christ are you saved are you born again you know there's so many religious people out there just like these these people here that we're at the temple area I mean where are they at they're at the temple. And what are people doing at the temple? What are they doing at the temple? They're trying to worship, aren't they? They're trying to worship God. Whatever their thought process is, they're trying to worship God. But they're not all, they're not all born again. They're not all saved. But they're there at a religious setting and not saved. So you think about that as he's trying to deal, deal with these people. But good point, Terry. Yeah, in today's world, we got people that are very religious, but do they really know the Lord in their lives? Anybody else? Anything else? Yes, brother. Yeah. Yeah. They did. That's not what they wanted to hear. They did not want to hear a lot of stuff he was saying. But when he told them he was, I am. I really, yes, Brandon.
stopping the basic terminology because the terminology can be the same to the definition is very different. So being able to define the biblical terminology in the Bible as opposed to the religious teaching. So important that people might say these same things and not sound similar, but it doesn't mean this. Right. Good point. Good point. Because people are so stuck in tradition, you know, in the thought process there. But yes, you got to make sure when somebody says, I believe in God, you might have to dig in a little bit deeper on that to understand where, they, where they're coming from, you know, their thought. Anybody else? Anything else? That's right. Yep, even the devil believes. Anybody else? Anything else? All right, before we uh, pray, uh, get dismissed. Remember, the series on Jonah is up here. Uh, of course, we've got lessons 12 and 13, so it'll be in about three weeks we'll start the book of Jonah for you there. All right, let's go, Lord, in prayer, and we'll do this. this. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, dear Lord, thank you for your, for your grace. Thank you for uh, going through the Sunday school lesson a little differently, but that maybe it would help us to understand your word better and, and to... Um, and, and, and the fumbling ways of trying to present your word and try to explain and, and to see and to show. And, but Lord, that you be honored and glorified because that's what counts is that you are always honored and glorified. Uh, help us, Lord, how to learn from your word and, and to, to draw closer to you, to be a, a witness to people we deal with and uh, how, to be, how to share the gospel with some, some others that we meet. We meet in stores. We meet in wherever we're at. Lord, even with all this, we'll keep dealing with this... this um, COVID situation, Lord, but help us how to be a witness, a testimony to people. And guide and direct, Lord, this morning, help our pastor the strength and the grace and the wisdom he needs. Hug him beside you, Lord, and take care of him and, and help us, Lord, how to, uh, to worship together, to come into your house to worship, uh, to be together in your house and worshiping together. Help those working with the children, the wisdom they need and how uh, to reach the children there in the children's church ministries. And just guide and direct throughout the day in our lives. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen.